All right, today we have a very special guest on our Handful of Leaves podcast, where we bring you practical Buddhist wisdom for a happier life. We have Ray with us, whom I've met at this Buddhist Film Fest last year, 2023. He is the director and producer of Waking Up 2050. So welcome, Ray, to our podcast. Thanks so much for having me. I'm so flattered and honored to be here that, that you want to hear my thoughts. <laughs> No, I mean, I, I feel honored to have you here. <laughs> so what is Waking Up 2050? Right. Waking Up 2050 is a contemplation about Buddhism's relevance in the hypothetical future, far future, and the very present, examined through perspectives of truth, kindness, and beauty. I, I know in the film, you actually interviewed uh, a few people to share yeah. their thoughts about what it means to be Buddhist, right? Yeah. And it was interesting to me that... Mm. After the film was screened, we have this post dialogue and you shared that it was only recently that you identified yourself as one. So I'm very mm. curious what made you decide, like, hey, you know, I can call myself a Buddhist now. If, if it only was like just waking up to be uh, like, oh, here, here I am. No, it's um, on paper. I was always Buddhist, but only two years ago, I, I've taken refuge and committed myself in ceremony to this identity. Opportunity came up when uh, my, my teacher, Lopen uh, Pemadeki, offered it to the Sangha. And thankfully, I was in the right mindset to see the importance of it and say, okay, yes, I'll do it. My parents, you know, they would say it's just ritual. You don't need to take refuge. It's all superficial, superstitious. You, you, you just need, need to have it in your heart. What's, what's with all the fuss, right? But for, for me, leading to that moment to see the significance and the, the gravity of, of taking refuge was a lifetime or maybe many lifetimes of experiences and events. You know, quite often it is when life takes a difficult turn that you see where your mind is at. Yeah, there's some major events in my life that made me feel ready at that moment. So 2019, my, my father had a stroke. And at that time, I was still in Berlin. I think it was April Fool's Day. I just started my first day at work and I had to get the first flight back. On the long way back home, I've never prayed so hard in my life. There, so much for rational Buddhists, right? I was just praying, you know, going in Tara. And whether or not it was because of my prayers, my dad survived the stroke. And, you know, I think it's not a thing learned in a moment. It's like a childhood of going to temples. And at that moment, it helped me. When logic and rationality have no place, you cannot do anything about it. Even then, I didn't officially call myself a Buddhist. So in 2021, a few years later, I don't know if you're familiar with the film John Wick. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So it's kind of like a wild caricature experience of samsara, you know. So at that time, I just finished school and I, I was looking for a job. And a friend said, hey, that's a gig for, for quick money. Do you want to come along? It's just to show up. I said, okay, fine, I'll show up. And I, and I show up to this crazy set. And it was being a movie extra on the set. I was dressed up in crazy, colorful clothes. You have crazy lightings and you have people fighting everywhere. Beautiful bodies moving and Keanu Reeves not dying. <laughs> Whatever they do to him. <laughs> and one of the other extras there I met, so it was like a nine day shooting. She's this young German girl. We got on really well. There's, there's a lot of waiting in between every take and you can start to talk. She's just starting her school studies, being a social worker, and she's a great dancer. She's a passionate dancer. So this young, vibrant life, right? When, you know, the filming wrapped up, you know, in a WhatsApp group, we were just going to meet at, at this bar and then came this message. Hey, um, sorry guys, but Leila is in hospital. But before we could even process, a few hours later, the boyfriend said, she's gone. We hear about death. We know people die. But, you know, it's the first time to have that loss, you know, in front of my eyes. So it's very harrowing. Even thinking about it now, so many years. But then I thought, oh, okay, what can I do? I'm a sort of Buddhist. What can I do to help? Even without formal training, you sort of know, okay, after death, that's this process, right? I was so sort of perplexed. So do I go, no, Mami Taba? Like, would, would she know? Because she, she's just German. She's atheist. Like, how would it help? So at that point, Pema Deki was already my teacher. So I, I was just very lucky to be able to just message her, say, hey, this happened. What can I do? So she, she guided me. And I think in that moment, it, be it became clear to me that, wow, you know, we always talk about precious human life, right? But it's just worse until you really see a, a young, precious human life is just gone and you, you are faced with, you, with your own mortality. So Lopen Pema Deki, you know, she taught me how to help her to as, as much as I can without the Buddhist context. Mm. And then a few months later, again, I was confronted with a passing of a dear friend. And it's different this time. He, he is someone who, who lived 
till 1882. So, so he lived a long life. He, he saw me as his own son. Again, I, I got hit with, okay, someone dear to me is leaving. What can I do? Mm -hmm. Again, he's not Buddhist, right? But then what's comforting for me was that even when his family, his sons, they aren't Buddhist, I was able to offer that prayer and offer sort of guiding in the process. Okay, here's what I've learned. The next seven days, theoretically, this is what happens. We should do this. We should offer our thoughts, remind him of his good deeds in his life, even in a very non-Buddhist way. Like there's no mention of Avalokiteshvara or anything. It helped them. It helped me also to face death. It's a huge process, right? And having that knowledge, having that skill, I was able to be calm and also extend that calmness, maybe also not make the situation worse. That is a program of action. Like, okay, this happens. What can we do? I could offer this. So when the moment came from my teacher, I said, okay, I would offer a refuge ceremony. In my heart, I said, like, definite yes. Because I see the necessity to commit myself to the training for my parents, for friends, for loved ones or other people. I want to be able to be skillful and to be able to provide support in those situations. And so, yeah, sorry, that's a really long, long answer for... No, um, it, it's beautiful how things unfold. You, you were born a Buddhist, like on, yeah. on paper, same as I am. <laughs> but innately, you're already having faith of this yeah. uh, thing beyond ourselves, right? That prayers mm. work, there's some form of faith that divine intervention does work and mm. our sincerity in yeah. sending our good wishes <laughs> to people. So mm. you have all those things. And then what you saw was the divine messengers in the Buddhist context. We see old age, sickness yeah. and death. And you met two of those very, yeah. very close. And it got you to think like, wow, life is very transient. So when the opportunity struck for you to formally yeah. commit, and I, I guess it's also like an accountability ceremony. I can't take this just as a, you know, oh, a joke. Sometimes I want to <laughs> be a little bit better. Some days I want not to be so wholesome. <laughs> it's like, okay, I'm Buddhist. I'm walking a Buddhist path. And th there's benefit not just to ourselves, but to other people. And for you, it almost seemed like you were more motivated because Mm. committing to the training helps you to support the people around you yeah that definitely that's that's, that's a definitely uh, a pragmatic and practical aspect to it mm -hmm. compassion and wisdom they're not fuzzy fluffy ideas they have a practical function even buddhist rituals we dismiss them very easily we look down on them but then there are domains in life where rationality has its mm -hmm. limits and, and and in those intuitive and and emotional parts of life yeah, you need wisdom. You need to learn how to cope and, and use it constructively. I was just just thankful that I had this Buddhist experience, even though it was maybe messy and not focused. But, you know, when life puts obstacles in your face and even though if it's not clear yet, I, I do see the point of this goal now. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's interesting because my path was a little bit different. So for you, yeah, okay. you took the official ceremony in order to be like, okay, I'm a Buddhist now, <laughs> right? I'm yeah. committed. Yeah, for, there, there wasn't really like a day where I feel like, okay, I am mm. one. But yeah. I suppose the closest thing was when I went to the Buddhist center at a youth service, mm. and then we had to read the five precepts. Right. And yeah. it felt like it's not a commandment but it's kind of like an aspiration that hey you know i'm mm. gonna try to refrain from all this not yeah. so wholesome acts mm. and there is power in reciting those because mm. i need to be accountable to myself and this is a yeah. constant reminder when i do it every week some people might feel like formal mm. ceremony of going to take refuge is not so important because i think mm. that's more prominent in some traditions like the Tibetan and the Mahayana right. for a Theravada tradition, maybe mm. um, the more form formal ceremony would be to don on the robes and then shave your head, mm. maybe temporarily or permanently, not sure. Right. Um, but while we don't need this formal ceremony to say, okay, you're a Buddhist now, uh, it, <laughs> it does have some form of symbolic meaning to yeah. help us practice and walk the path. But having said that also, Mm. It's not to say like, okay, now I have the certificate or I've <laughs> taken refuge. I can break the precepts and mm. not practice virtue as well as concentration and wisdom. It's like a constant thing. Sometimes we fall behind, sometimes we backslide and then we stand up again. So I'm very curious about like, how do you define what a Buddhist or a good Buddhist is? 
Is it about like being able to pray or like when your friends are in need? Just, that's, that's just like the, the side effects. Uh, I think the main thing is it, commitment, not to a, a external divine being or, or some abstract idea, but you know, it's like anything, right? Even doctors have to take vows. It's really about taking responsibility to actually know that this is, this is my path to walk and there's no one else to blame. It's my actions. Mm. It's what I do from now on, right? It's in a way like growing up. I think in all aspects of life, you know, if, if the moment you take on responsibility, accountability, then you're starting to grow up. But being Buddhist is not about like, you know, I just go to temple when, when things are fine or, or not fine. You know, it's, it's all day, every day. It's a cultivation. And to, to answer your question of how do I define a Buddhist, I actually had to go and ask my teacher. Because I think we all know the, the standard definition of a Buddhist, right? Like uh, someone who has taken refuge in a Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha, or someone who is born in a Buddhist country. So more like countries in Thailand, Bhutan, where Buddhism is the fabric of life or people who have the view, right? But when, when you ask me th th this question, this big elephant in the room, what about people who like me as a kid, I just go to the temple without having this clear thought of, okay, I'm, I'm going to a temple for, for Buddha, Dharma, Sangha. I, I didn't have that as a kid, but does that count? I actually had to consult my teacher and, and she said, short answer, yes. Because if you go to the temple, even to a Guanyin temple, there are Dharma texts there. And Guanyin is also a embodiment of Buddha and, and noble Sangha, right? Bodhisattva, and she has a Buddha on the crown. Mm. And also the custodians, the people working in the temple, the Sangha, so the monastics there. So in a very subtle, basic level, yes, I, I think that still counts as Buddhist. But I think- What is the non-basic level? <laughs> The non-basic life, I think like for you and for, for me, when we decide to take on that responsibility, I think that brings us to another level where it's more, for lack of a better word, more powerful. You, you're more conscious of what you're doing. It's not so random anymore. You know, it's a conscious effort. Like, you know, I want to be a conscious agent of, of wisdom and compassion, right? I want to put this into my life, you know? And we, we truly see the benefits of it as well. It's yeah. not just going with the motion of like the rites and the rituals without right. uh, knowing what mm. the meaning is, but... It's more of like the wisdom piece, which you mentioned quite a few times, right? Like, what is the mm. ultimate goal? It's to free ourselves from greed, hatred, and delusion. And how right. do we do that? Avoid evil, do good, and purify the mind. Yeah. So it is the path the Buddha has laid out, the Noble Eightfold mm. Path. And all Buddhas have thought the same thing. Yeah, It's, it's like slowly erasing the delusion that we have. Mm. And then the sense of urgency and responsibility to practice becomes even more because we know that I'm still subjected to old age, sickness and death. Yeah. And as long as I am still in the cycle of birth and death, I can't be freed from this. So yeah. we know that we've got things to do. <laughs> to be yeah, and yeah then, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, like the Buddha has really given us the cure, right? We are considered as patients and he's the doctor. Why don't we take his medicine, which is very, very effective. Quite, quite. I uh, know, and also this refuge thing, right? It's also not like a, oh, level up, but it's, it's more like I, I've taken a refuge and then I realize, oh, wow, there's still so much more to learn. I think wherever uh, any Buddhist is at, it's good to have moments of reflection and checking with yourself, where, where am I now? Where, where's my mind at? No, because that informs all your actions, your relationships with your parents, your friends. Would you um, say that after you have gone through the formal ceremony, your Mm. You're a little bit different from before, before you formally identify yourself as a Buddhist. I've got three heads and six arms now. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, no, More no. special abilities. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can levitate. No, in, in some ways, nothing's changed. I'm, I'm still me. But in many ways, I think it, it changed. I think my confidence of saying, yes, I'm a Buddhist, and it, it also gave them the confidence to approach me when they come to a difficulty. I feel so lucky that I was able to be their support, e even if it's not just solving their problems. With even the limited amount of Buddhist training I've had so far, and I was able to skillfully see, okay, what do they need in this moment? Do they just need uh, someone to listen? But it's not necessarily solving their problems. Like when my colleague, their dog died, they didn't know what to do, and they know that I'm, I'm Buddhist, so they approached me and said, like, what do we do? <laughs> no. <laughs> it brings comfort, right? Like being able to yeah. do something, even exactly. though it's not logical at all. Like it's not going to resurrect the pet or anything no. like that. But it has a but, very powerful effect. Yeah, yeah. It, 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 we shouldn't underestimate the grieving process, dealing with death. We are so bad at advice. We sort of like... We should away. Not, we should away. There's no goodbye, but I think it's important to do a good goodbye. I told him sort of about... 
like the 49 days, but the seven days, <laughs> having this vague structure, it gave them a protocol to work on their grief. You know, I felt very, very lucky that I was able to provide that at, at that point. So there are these kind of benefits, being confident as to call yourself a Buddhist. You can apply yourself more focusedly. You, you see a problem and you can go to the solution and not like, here's what mm -hmm. I can do. Yeah, yeah. I can resonate with that because I used to be very shy about yeah. this, like calling myself a Buddhist. I'm like, oh, every weekend I go to the Buddhist center, I volunteer. Because right. yeah. it's such an unfamiliar thing for a young adult to be doing. Yeah. And I was afraid that I would weird people out. <laughs> right, yeah. And the funny thing was when I started becoming more open and mm. identifying myself as one and being okay with one, people come to me and like, hey, you know, I, I have this trouble. Can yeah. you give me some suggestions? I think mm. late last year, some of my primary school or secondary school friends, somehow we were connected on Instagram like many years right. ago. They saw me actively posting about Buddhist uh, reflections and then they mm. asked me like, hey, you know, where can I learn more of this or like to volunteer? And they were really sincere about it. So yeah, I thought it's not a bad thing after all because if people are searching, then you can be the source for them to share insights and wisdom or direct them to some better teachers. Having that focus, which you mentioned is like, what do I use as a guide in my daily actions? What do I prioritize? Now it yeah. becomes very clear that, okay, in my day, mm. are my activities to reduce greed, hatred, and delusion? Mm. Uh, am I entangled in this world and getting distracted and intoxicated with my youth, thinking yeah. that I have all the time in the world and then I might still end up scrolling <laughs> you know, <laughs> on, on social media and stuff. But then having that recollection to say, hey, this is like Mara, the, the devil yeah. thing trick on our mind. Yeah. And then having that perseverance and mm. knowing that, hey, we also got friends on the path with that yeah. same goal and same dedication and commitment. I can use them as an inspiration. Then it becomes very um, motivating in some sense, rather than like you say, very fuzzy. Like, oh, am I? Am I not? Because <laughs> I, I know yeah. some people they might not necessarily be very inclined to calling themselves a Buddhist, right? Mm -hmm. But yeah, I like Buddhist philosophy. <laughs> so they might subscribe to different teachings. Yeah. So I, I'm not so sure, like your thoughts about that. Do you, Do you think it's absolutely important for one to, at some oh, point, right. consider themselves a Buddhist? <laughs> if it motivates them to take refuge and behave like a Buddhist. If that motivates them to do it, then yes. Then identify to your heart's content. You're committing to being a, a good human being in okay, a skillful like Buddhist that. way. And there's nothing shameful about it. But I, I totally understand, you know, I, I grew up in Singapore as well. And I know till today, there's this huge cultural and social taboo. Like you don't speak up religion, right? Even some of my dear friends, very dear friends, like say, hey, I made a documentary about Buddhism. Here's the link. Till today, they have not seen it. You know, because it's religion. Oh. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> so I absolutely get the uh, hesitancy to mm. be open about it that way. But as a Buddhist now, of course, being skillful, you have to see what context. But, you know, I think in, in Europe, I'm kind of lucky in the sense that Buddhist has a good rep in a way. They see it as something more progressive and scientific. So there's no baggage. With, so so mm. that's lucky, luck, lucky for me. But I, I do see the difficulties in the Asian context in Singapore. When I took refuge, even my mom, the first reaction was, Oh, are you joining a cult? <laughs> yeah. Oh, interesting. Uh, but she was the one who brought you to temples, right? When you I were know, no, no. That's a strange thing, right? I think that's a strange thing in Singapore. We see temples, we see statues. But again, it's familiar, but very foreign. Mm. Just because of this taboo thing, like, we don't talk about it. It's like Harry Potter and Voldemort, right? Like, he who shall not be named. We don't talk about it. And I think with time, you sort of lose that connection to what is actually meant for, you know, the functions and its meaning, its purpose. I think that's also why, you know, young adults uh, lose interest in Buddhism, right? Because it's sort of in your face, but I don't really know what it is. So mm. I reject it because I don't understand it. Its purpose, its place in my life sort of got pushed into a very private thing. And what do we do in our private lives? We, we go to shopping malls and whatever we do. <laughs> so it's very neglected. And I think that's part of the development of modernization right you have the separation of secularity where religion or faith gets boxed into a very private thing in terms of practicing buddhists for example you lose connection to this uh, tradition i think what if someone says that i can call myself spiritual rather than identifying with any religion because <laughs> as a spiritual person I mean, the definition is to seek out for the truth, right? It's pretty much yeah. quite similar. You believe that there's something beyond the self and you yeah. want to improve your own right. well-being and reach your fullest potential, etc. Mm. Then would, would it be okay to call myself spiritual? Then 
religious or Buddhist? Well, in, in Buddhist point of view, anything's okay as long as it, 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 it puts you in the right view and right motivation. But when I was younger, I was one of those people that said, oh, I'm, I'm spiritual. I'm not religious. <laughs> uh, <laughs> what changed? <laughs> Yeah, but I, I think it's somehow a compl com complicated thing as well. I found this out when I was doing research for documentaries. We have to be aware that they're very modern terms. This split from religion and spirituality is academic split that came from the 90s, right? Mm. Also so, recent? Yeah, very recent. Because they've been trying to define religion for many years. Uh, and then there's this split where religion is something pertaining to God, right? It's something that the worshiper worship externally to a higher being. And spirituality, which is, I guess, the rest, it includes Hinduism, Buddhism, Taoism, where it's about the individual inward looking, find the sacred within. So that's the definition of these two. And just briefly about religion, I think for any Buddhist or anyone interested in religion, there's this scholar called Karen Armstrong, very erudite, very eloquent scholar. She wrote, there are many uh, kinds of definitions about religion, right? And I think she put it in a very uh, succinct way. Religion is an art. You know, religion in scriptures is an art. But art doesn't mean that it's not true. It doesn't mean that it's just fluff. Karen Armstrong, she says, in the pre-modern world before modernity, there are these two sort of ways of thinking. You have the mythological way and the logical way, logos. Logos is where science is really good at. Rationality, measurements, description of reality. But you have also mythos. I think some academics also try to remove it, but you really can't. This superstition or, or emotional, irrational part of the human consciousness. That's why we have so many uh, legends, so many myths, right? That's like pre-modern psychology. And so you, we have to recognize that the term for religion as a concept is a modern invention. It started late 17th century, 18th century. So if you look... In, in Greek or Latin, there's no equivalent for the word religion. Like maybe a Latin credo is, is, I believe, but originally it's called cordo. So to give your heart to something. So religion was never really about proclaiming, I believe or whatever. It's about giving your heart, committing to something. So this commitment, this action, Karen Armstrong defined it as a program of action. Religion, spirituality, it's something that you work at. So it's a practice. And I think we have to recognize that. And I think back in my youth, when I was saying, oh, I'm spiritual, I think it came from also the idea that, so, so we've got actual definitions, right? But I think back then, I didn't know the set definitions. And for me, and I think for many people, religion is something about control and it's, it's something backward. And spirituality is like, you know, I get to decide what, I, you know, thinking yeah, back. It feels more stuff's... fluid because religion kind of puts you in a box, right? It feels like you have to yeah. be obligated to do certain rituals, abide by the rules. Yeah. And then it can be quite suffocating for some people, especially the younger generations who likes to rebel and own their personality, yeah, yeah. And, like activism and rights and all of this, like, like a freedom of expression. But it's kind of funny, but in, in a way, instead of I reject that box, I put myself in another box, spirituality. You know? <laughs> yeah, that, that is true. <laughs> <laughs> but I can definitely relate. I think everyone have had that stage in life where, you know, let's tear down the old and make something new. That notion we can all relate to in the sense that the grass is always greener, right? I'll adopt something different and call it my own. It's, I, I guess part of the consumer culture thing, we, we are so good at picking and choosing. I get to cherry pick. I, I, I decide what is useful for me, which is good in some sense. You, you work out what you need, but I think it's easy to lose the sense of reverence for something that has... has thousands of years of human history and hu human lives working at it, right? Who are we? Just, you know, I can do better. I, th I think it's like arrogance of youth, you know, that's what just thinking oh, about. Like, I, I don't I necessarily thinking? agree with that because the Buddha yeah. actually set out in search for the truth because he was like, yeah. yeah, there must be something better out there. <laughs> yes, yes. He also set out in search for truth in terms of also rebelling against what he had, right? So, so this disruption is necessary. Well, at least the way I did when I was younger, like saying I'm, I'm spiritual. It's just this disruption, but it's not skillful. You know, it's like... I, uh, I get I get what you mean. I reject it, but I don't do anything. I don't have a good alternative to it, you know. And instead, I'm, I'm just at the doors and looking for other doors. That's, that was the state I was in. Right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Th thanks for clarifying that. Because yeah. I, I know some people also do see Buddhism as like a religion and some people say like no it's not a religion because we <laughs> don't believe in 
like the ultimate creator and it, it's really more of like a, a practice mm. and you know journey and inner search but then we do have rituals as yeah, a means yeah. to help us kind of you know still our mind and also cultivate wisdom so yeah. i would say you're right to say that sometimes when we put ourselves in a box mm. uh, it becomes problematic because <laughs> There are just certain things that goes beyond logic and you can't really use yeah. all these conventions and words to describe, but mm. the focus is the same, right? You mentioned mm. commitment many times, like what makes us Buddhist or why is it important for us to call ourselves Buddhist? It's only when it motivates us mm. to act like one, which is do good, avoid evil and purify the mind. And the benefit of that is you get a better life and people around you also get a better life yeah, because exactly. you are uh, an improved version of yourself, like 2.0 or 3.0. <laughs> Yeah, but so you can also argue that Buddhism itself is a box, but this box is, is a beautiful box. It's a very beautiful destination, <laughs> you know, like provisionally it's as helpful, like mm -hmm. anything, like any label, labels are labels, but if that label helps you to, to be a better Buddhist, to be a better person, then by all means, right, if it opens up wisdom, if it makes you be wiser, kinder, then it is helpful, then it is skillful, Yeah. Yeah, and they also <laughs> say to cross to the other shore, which is to attain nirvana. Ultimately, right. we also have to let go of that box or like the rough. Yeah, yeah. Right. The very fetter that bounds us to the cycle of birth and death is one thing mm. to become or not one thing to become. And that yes. form of self, like I am, this is me, yeah. this is mine. Sometimes it feels like a paradox, but it's also very beautiful mm. because mm. it's exactly that, that the journey of the practice evolves. So yeah. from not having a label to finding importance of uh, identifying with a label and then seeing the benefits and then slowly letting that go. Yeah. And it, it's not a linear thing. No, exactly not. I, th I think that's also the thing about uh, the mod modern mind, like mind, right? We like to see everything from point A to B or just just have things very simplified or in bullet, bullet form. But, you know, I, I think uh, Buddhism sort of uh, speaks to people of... Uh, because we're all at different levels, right? And we always talk about, you know, Buddha has 84,000 methods because we are all at different stages of, of our mind and we have, all have different needs. So it's it's not linear and it, yeah. I mean, everyone has a very different path, but the yeah. conventional destination, it's the same, which is to, to be free, right? Yeah. Mm. So I hope this episode and this conversation does bring our audience some clarity yeah. and whether is it important to identify yourself as a Buddhist or not, it, it's really yeah. up to you. Do you have any final advice uh, for yeah, our I, I, I think for people who have hang-ups about taking refuge, I think there's also this fear of commitment and fear of losing freedom. But I think taking refuge, you have to ask yourself, how do you define freedom? Is, I don't know, watching Netflix, <laughs> your idea of freedom, and, and just investigate, find out what taking refuge actually means. For anyone who's curious or interested in Buddhism, it's fine to read books and stuff to gather knowledge. But I think ultimately, it's something you have to do. You have to walk it. You can learn, you can read all about swimming, but never touching water, then there's a big disconnect, right? You have to jump into the pool, get wet, you know. And you have to struggle first. <laughs> yeah. I know some people, they have the, the concept like, I can meditate, you know, my mind is restless. I can't call myself a Buddhist. Yeah. Or, I can, I'm not cut out for meditation <laughs> or I still like to drink. I sometimes break the precepts. So nah, I, right. I can't commit. Uh, yeah. And I think we have to remind ourselves like Buddha didn't just achieve all that in, in one lifetime, right? He spent many lifetimes, eons to get that point. And we are all trying in our imperfect ways to follow his footsteps. And my, my teacher always reminds us, just relax and do your best to just bring your mind back to like what is important. All that elaboration, doubt, drop it. Just, just you know, mm. focus. Yeah, yeah, that, that's very beautiful. Uh, and, and I guess the final word for anyone who's still wondering, just, you know, the time is now. I wish I've done it earlier in life where I'm younger, I could memorize more things. There's so much to learn now. I wish I could learn this when I'm a, <laughs> in a younger mind. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, so yeah, time is now. If you're wondering, if you're curious, just take it. Thank you for sharing. Very beautiful. Yeah. So we covered a lot about <laughs> what it means to be a Buddhist and the yeah. historic journey and <laughs> transformation of how we came to be, how spirituality and religion became so prevalent as two words. But it's actually only very recent that these are kind of introduced to us from the academic standpoint. So that was interesting. Mm -hmm. And whether is it really important to call yourself a Buddhist, you, the listeners, can <laughs> share with us in the comment section below. And thank you so much, Ray, for sharing. For our listeners and audience, if you want to check out the 
documentary, Waking Up 2050. Can they find us online? No, not yet, but I think soon there will be an opportunity to see it again online. Okay, F yeah, fantastic. Yeah. And we'll keep our audience posted. <laughs> Definitely. All right. right. Until Thank the so next much. episode, may you stay happy and wise. Thank you. Thank you.